Hello. As with any form of art, it's always about creativity, and creativity comes from within. When you learn the fundamentals, um, it makes it easier to express yourself within your work and be creative. We don't want to create carbon copies of ourselves or even our teachers, um, but we do need to breed creativity through knowledge and understanding. But what is creativity? In creativity, there really isn't that much of a right or wrong. So, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Dave Swallow, and these are some of the artists that I've worked with over the past uh, few years. Um, in 2008, I decided I was going to write a book, because my mum told me to. Um, <laughs> and uh, in December, it came out, in America, and in January this year it came out uh, in the rest of the world, and uh, this is this is my my work. Um, it's a kind of day to day life on the road kind of thing. The things that I have needed in my career, um, and I hope it's uh, I hope it's good for. Anybody into audio, enthusiasts, professionals, or e even amateurs, and I hope everybody can take something away from it. Um, this presentation is kind of the development of the book. It's some of the information I'm going to we're going to be talking about today is in the book. Some of it isn't, and it's just um, it's not necessarily all about the technical aspects. We're talking about how to be creative in what we're doing. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time, so um, I can't really go into a lot of the technical detail because some of it is very technical and we can talk about it all afternoon. Um, but if you have any questions, please save them for the end and I'll do some question, questions and answers. Uh, so I'm going to talk for about 30, 35 minutes. Um, yeah, and we'll do a Q&A afterwards. So the first thing we need to talk about when... Um, we're talking about creativity, is what are the boundaries? What are our boundaries um, that we have to work within every single day when we come to a show? So, um, as mixers, we're the creative ones. We should be leading the industry from the front. We should be turning around to the manufacturers and saying, why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Having a sound in your head and trying to recreate that sound every single night. And we need to get the manufacturers to make this stuff work for us. But we also need to understand the equipment that we're using. And together we can push audio forward and forward and forward. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about boundaries. Like the first boundary is the room. Now the room never changes its sound. When you put a PA system into a room, it's the speaker that you're changing. It's the, it's the relationship with the speaker and the room that you're manipulating. Um, now the room only changes its sound if you knock a wall down, you do some acoustics to it or put an audience in the room. Um, so it's the ability to change the sound of, the, uh, sound of that speaker that fits in that room. It's kind of an important way to look at it, because I know sometimes we talk about tuning the room or EQing the room, it's actually the other way around, and it's, it might not seem important, but when you change your mentality, it can, it can actually change the way you think about the room and think about the mix, so rather than fighting to try and get your sound in that room, you need to work with the natural acoustics of the room. Um, the, the next boundary is uh, the equipment. All the equipment that we use has coloration in it, whether it's microphones, mixing desks, even digital consoles um, have coloration somewhere along it, along the, along the signal path. Hello? There we go. Um, yeah, so anything in the line of the, uh, anything in the path of your signal has some form of coloration. And then the other one, 
is the artist. Now, every single artist has their own sound. I mean, it sounds fairly obvious, but it's kind of worth pointing out. You don't want to give poor old C6 Steve here a Pantera-style uh, kick drum. It just doesn't work. I mean, I think we naturally steer away from that. It's a bit of an extreme example. But it's kind of worth remembering that they have their own uh, sound in their head. Um, so, the next thing is, we just talked about those boundaries. Now, what about if we think about our, those boundaries in a very different way? So, how can we apply an artistic application to, to the, these four things? I've split PA system and equipment for a very good reason. Um, so, our room becomes our canvas. Our PA system becomes our paintbrush, our equipment or our colours, and our artist is our commission. So we're going to think about it in a very kind of arty farty way. I think that's pretty good, in my opinion. Um, so what what does this what does this mean? Um, this is, a, I hate using this word, living in the age of high definition audio. Um, it's a bit, a bit of a funny one. Anyway, um, all the equipment that we're using over the past, over well, ever since we started doing live gigs, has become more and more and more refined. To the point where today, some of the equipment that we've got is so good, it's like you can cr paint an audio picture. Now, I want to show you two images. It's Monet and his Dali. Now, both obviously very famous painters, both stunning in their own right, but two very, very different styles. Um, and we can do this in audio. Our audio perception is far greater than our, than our visual perception. We, have, we can hear everything 360 degrees, where we only look forward. We, ha we can hear, was it 10 octaves? We only see in colour one. But just, uh, and if you're going to convert what we hear into frames per second, so what, what HD is, what, 30 frames per second, I think it is? Something like that? In, if you're going to convert our audio perception into frames per second, it would come in at something like 15,000 frames per second. So this is how much information we can process just without even thinking about it. So we can create this as, a, as, a, as an audio picture. Um, so how do you create? How, what, what, what are each of our creative um, instincts. What do we, what, how, do we, how do each and every single one of us, when we get behind the desk, what do we rely on? Well, we've got four things. We've got our instinct, we've got our, our intuition, and we've got, um, did I say four? I meant three. Um, <laughs> and our influence. Um, so, Instinct, because when you understand the music, you're really inside it. And that's quite a natural thing. If you're into music, and let's face it, we're all in here right now, we're into music. Um, and then let your understanding of that music guide your mix. It's a very fluid, creative process. And... Understand your influences. Now, um, we're all guilty of obtaining an opinion without having the proper knowledge. So it's really important to understand why you've come to your own conclusions when you're make, when you're when you're one when you're choosing equipment and you know learning how to uh, or un trying to understand how to put your mix together. Um, so moving on. We, when we're talking about mixing, we come across um, three primary elements, the building blocks of every single mix. Now, whether it's rock and roll, jazz, funk, blues, grindcore, whatever you're into, um, there are three fundamental primary elements 
But when you get them all right, when you understand them properly, your mix just falls into place. Now the first one, and most importantly, is phase. Phase is the most fundamental part of any, any sound. Um, before we had EQ, we had phase. And then, uh, in fact, um, for those of, the, those of you that don't know, fa um, actually fa um, EQ is a, a derivative of phase. Um, so I'm going to show you this little picture here. Um, transient smear. Now, my friend Tony Andrews introduced me to this idea a, little, a few years ago. And what this picture shows us is one waveform, but then three different arrival times of it. And that can come from all different speakers in, a, in an array. And <coughs> what happens here is like taking a, taking a, painting a line and then smudging it. it doesn't, it's not very defined. Not very clear. But when you get all these bits and pieces together, you can get a really, really, really nicely defined mix. Um, and kind of moving back to a, my earlier uh, analogy of, of, of paintbrushes, the more in phase all your waveforms are, it's like using a very fine laser. And the more apart they become, it's like using a bigger and bigger paintbrush until you're rollering a room all, all in one colour. Um, so that's really important when it comes to putting your, putting your mix together, understanding that you know, if everything is in, in place, it's going to sound, it's going to be easier to get a great sound out of it. Um, the next one is um, filters. Now, um, th this might look a bit odd to most of you, it looks a bit odd to me, but High and low pass filters is a really uh, creative way of making the sound sound how you want it. By using filters, you can clean up a PA system. You can even dirty it up if you want. And the way this works, and this is quite clever, in horn-loaded systems, you have um, different arrival times. There's, well, there's phase harmonic distortion in horn-loaded systems. Now, I said earlier how accurate our hearing is. Now, we can detect it's about, I think it's uh, about 13 microseconds dis difference in, in arrival times. And this is all about phase. Now, when you start getting up to the, uh, to the high-end frequencies here, the because the wavelengths are so short, as they're coming out of a horn, they start bouncing around. So there's a slight phase differential in what's, what's coming out of that speaker. And we hear that as kind of distortion. So um, adding a filter, you're kind of cutting out all of that irrelevant information that we can't hear. And um, going back to uh, EQ and phase, um, you're actually applying a phase shift, you're, but you're applying one phase shift at, uh, at zero milliseconds. So it cleans everything up. Um, think of it as mastering your PA system. It's very subtle, but it really does, when you, when you actually understand how to use it, it can re, um, really give dividends at the end. Um, and the next one, um, this is really important. I mean, they're all really important. But this one, for me, is, is a, a fundamental, dynamics. Now, if everything's at unity and you're throwing it out, it's fucking loud, um, it's boring. It's not, it, without peaks and drops, the mix becomes boring. Your audience, um, they need those peaks and drops to kind of really, in, like, act to the music. So having those peaks and drops in your mix, having space in your mix, is actually quite exciting. And what we're after is an exciting mix. Um, and also, the other thing about keeping space in your mix is that it's, it gives your mix room to breathe. It's easier to insert another 
some strings or some brass in it. If everything's so loud, you can't really hear it. You can't differentiate between what's being played. And a good trick is uh, turn around when you're mixing and listen for what you can listen for what you can hear. Um, and if you can't if you can't hear it, if you can't hear that bass guitar doing what it's supposed to be doing, then there's something wrong. Um, so they're kind of my three main elements of putting any, 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 any mix together. Now, the most important bit that we're all here for, um, mixing. I can't tell you how to mix, as we did established earlier. It's personal, subjective. So, um, but there are, quite, there are a few fundamental things that we can talk, we can talk about. And uh, hopefully, we're all going to go away from this um, with a bit more of an insight into making, making things just a little bit better. And the first one, um, I, I made up this word, I think. Um, archiphonic, chief sound. What is the focal point of, um, what's the focal point of your mix? Normally, it's the vocal. Um, but, then the solo comes in. So it changes. Const your focal point is constantly changing, which is, always, which is very interesting. Now, you need to draw that from the mix. Now, um, I want to show you an, uh, another picture. This is, uh, this is another Dali. Anyone know this? Seen this? This is, uh, this is a dream caused by the flight of a bee. Um, and... This painting wouldn't exist if it wasn't for this. So that is the focal point. That is where this entire picture came from. So think about when you're putting your mix together, when you're listening to that piece of music that's being played, that sometimes the most interesting element is the first bit that that artist came up with. They might have had a little riff in the middle eight that this whole song came from, this little B, that's where it all came from. So understanding that there's a lot more going on than just your vocal, your drums and your guitars. The little melodies, the little subtleties can add a really, really interesting aspect to your mix. Um, now, the next thing is impact. How do we get our mix to impact on our audience? And this is, um, it's actually, <coughs> when, you go and, when you go and see a band or you mix a band, normally when the kick drum comes in, subs are everywhere, it's hitting you in the chest, but there's no definition. And trying to get your audience into a mix that hasn't got any definition in the low end is impossible. You can turn your kick drum up so much that you're, that you're blowing the air out the other end of the venue. But if it's not defined, then it's really hard to get your, get your audience jumping, fists in the air. So we need tight, percussive sounds to get those feet tapping and those fists pumping. Um, I kind of, I call it all balls and no trousers. Because it's, uh, um, it, or you're, you're overwhelmed by this amount of this amount of energy, but then there's nothing to back it up with. Um, so think about that when you're putting your low end together. And in fact, it's if you're installing a PA system, maybe a hire company or um, or an installation company, think about the subs you're using. Because if you've got a really flappy sub, it's going to be impossible to get tight percussive sounds. Um, now, moving slightly on, compressors. This is always a really interesting one for me, but I am boring and old. Um, so, compressors. Um, anybody know how to set a compressor up? No? Okay, good. <laughs> um, actually, what I'm going to show you here is, a, is, a, is an, old, um, an old studio technique, actually, and I, I, I learnt this probably about five, six years ago. And what it's kind of based on is 
um, how, to, how to listen to what your compressor is doing. You need, what you need to do is when you're setting it, you need to make it obvious. And then once, once you understand where you listen in your, uh, to your compressor, then, it's, uh, then you actually understand the, the whole creative process. Because uh, compressors are, can add an extra dynamic to your mix, if you think about it, attack and release. You can change the rhythm of what's happening with your compressors. So, little uh, fundamental, I drew these. Um, so, um, yeah, what, what we need to do when we're setting up our compressor is to turn the ratio right up. And we're going to turn our threshold right up. <coughs> then what we do is turn our attack right down and turn our release right down, so it's as fast as it goes. So you're going to have a horrible mess coming out of your speakers when you do this. But what we're doing is we need to listen to each individual bit. So we turn our attack up, and you can hear that transient information, that most important part of a waveform. You can hear it. So you can hear when the compressor is starting to be applied. Then we change our release, which gives you the length of the length of the compression. And remember that it doesn't have to return to zero before the next beat comes in. And this is where you get your extra extra dynamic from, so you can make things pump. Quite interesting. Um, and then work. Uh, then we turn our ratio down, that gives you the amount of compression that you want to, uh, that you want to apply. And then, then move your threshold to when it's applied. And using this little technique, which is great fun, um, you can really kind of get to grips with how your compressor's working over your whole mix. And, you know, using it on <coughs> guitars, bass, vocals, you, you're protecting your transient information. And that transient information is really important because in those first few microseconds of a waveform can give you the difference between a guitar and a violin. If you take that off completely, if you cut it off, you, it's really hard to decipher a piano, a violin, guitar. And obviously, you know, we as sound engineers, we need to make sure that people know what they're listening to. So that's a really good technique. To, uh, to, to get you into understanding and listening to how a compressor works. Um, and the, the next thing I'll talk about is creating space. How to, um, how to think of a mix as something a bit more, a bit more depth. We have... Um, Creating space isn't just a case of panning one thing left and one thing right and giving, giving the audience a 2D, or ourselves, a, a 2D image. Now, stepping into kind of the realms of 3D here, um, this isn't an actual 3D effect. It's so hard and our consoles aren't quite there yet. But um, it's not far off the digital, in the digital domain we can, uh, we can really uh, start experimenting with, with actually making these things happen. So it's quite exciting. Um, now, when you have, sometimes, if you, I'm sure you've all come across it, when you get a, sometimes you get a line array, and you turn it up, and it's just, it's, it's quite, it feels like it's pushing you down into the cracks of the floor. How do you make it go back? How do you make it stand up, create space? Well, I kind of started playing around with this last summer. Um, and this works really well with, uh, with, with electronic bands. And it's, um, but also it works quite well with a lot of other bands as well, I must point out. Um, ambient reverb, I always set up an ambient reverb all the time. Um, because you never know how it's going to react, the room's going to react when you get people in. Um, you know, it could be a nice reverberant room and your mix is sitting nicely. 
and then people come in, it's dead. It's quite hard to listen to when, th when things are dead because we're not used to listening to things that haven't got any reverb on. So always set up an ambient reverb. Now, this is kind of to demonstrate a kind of a three-dimensional, in a, in a word, um, effect. So what you're doing is you've got your left and right and you've got, your, you've got X and Y axis and what this is trying to do is give you that Z axis. So, this, so your pre-delay becomes your stage depth. Now we use, use a, how we normally set up uh, delays with uh, is it one millisecond per foot or if you live on the other side of the um, English Channel quarter meter. Um, so setting your pre-delay, so like five milliseconds or something like that, will, um, the idea is that it gives you that little bit, a little bit more depth. Um, and then the, the next thing, and this is actually for me one of the most important, well two most important factors of any reverb, uh, diffusion and density. Now, not a lot of people actually I've come across recently don't really know what these two things do. Um, these two things give you the space in, in, in your reverb. So when we, listen to, when we listen to something in a room, it's, um, it fills up all the gaps between the repeats. So by turning these down, you get your reverb becomes more defined and, most importantly, helps your reverb sit naturally in the room. I'm sure quite a lot of you have, you've been using a reverb, you've got a set reverb for your drum kit, and then you go into the next venue, use exactly the same reverb, but it just doesn't sit right in the room. Try turning these down, because if they've got a naturally reverberant room, if you're trying to put a fake reverb into that room, it's going to fight against each other, so work with the natural acoustics of the room. Um, so yeah, so what we want to do is turn these right down, and then just pop a bit of high frequency dampening on. Um, and then, um, the least important part of, of any reverb is actually the reverb time. That just shows you how obvious the reverb is. So, um, and then, the, the way you set this up is a stereo send, stereo return, and then, you know, if you're adding reverb to a guitar on stage left or right, it's panned left or right, and you pan it left or right in your reverb. And as things get further and further back, you add more reverb to them. But the whole idea is it's subtle. So if it's loud, it's, it's, you, you've, over, you've over egged the pudding. So it needs to be subtle. You shouldn't be aware of it. Um, but it adds that much more depth to what you're doing. So, um, the, so just to recap, so pre-delay is your stage depth, diffusion density right down, so there's very, very defined repeats, uh, a bit of high frequency dampening, and then, uh, then add your reverb time. And um, that will, uh, reverb time sh shouldn't be anything more than a second or two, um, sorry, a second, nine, not 0.9 seconds at least, uh, at most. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, that's what I wanted to talk to you um, on the old mixing front. Um, and just, so just kind of to summarise, um, if you understand the theory, then you can get a lot more out of what you're doing, and you can really push those boundaries. Um, a mix is, well, a mix needs to be personal. And because a mix is personal, it will be subjective. And make your mix meaningful to you. And be passionate about what you do and how you do it. And I, something else I just thought about as I was saying that, question everything, question why you do it. Question, is that good enough? Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about, really. Um, so I'm going to leave you with, a f with like my four golden rules. Um, you're only as good as your last gig. Always remember what you're mixing. You can't polish a turd, but you can roll it in glitter. <laughs> and above all else, just keep it simple. So uh, thank you very much.
got any um, anybody got any questions? Yes. Yeah, the compression technique you mentioned before. Yeah. Did you? It, it was one that I was familiar with. I don't put my hand up, but uh, what it was was that. Uh, did you learn that in the same way that I did from a guy called John Michael Stavrou in the book Mixing with Your Mind? It's exactly the same. Oh, and um, no, I, I I didn't actually. Yeah. I I learned this. Um, quite a few years ago, but yeah, it's very, very similar yeah, technique. Yeah, it's yeah. a very old uh, studio technique. It, 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 really, it, it works. It, it adds so much more rhythm to compression, so that it, it makes it. Uh, but I mean, in, in live circuses, obviously, that's probably only, only, only work for one song, isn't it? Like, if well, it, yeah, it changes. Then, then, then you've got a whole different. You could have a whole different ball game. Like. Well, that's and that's it. It's. It, I kind of see it as a. Um, in in my book, I call them constructive and destructive yeah. uh, dynamics. Right. And with constructive dynamics, what you're doing is you're trying to fix something, bad playing. Yeah. And destructive, you're playing with the waveform. Right. Um, and I see that as, you know, when, yeah, when the songs change, you're, const you're on, you're on your right. dynamics and you're, you're, make, you're making those changes. And it's, it's all about making that mix more personal. Yeah. Because, you know, Bass players get into different songs, you know, drummers get into different songs, you know, they're human, it's, you know, they're playing a boring song, they're not going to put the heart and soul into it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, um, yeah, but uh, it's a great book, actually. I, I just, just finished reading it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Completely different approach, really. Completely non-technical, ballistic approach, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you, uh, have you, t you taken much from it? I've read it three times. <laughs> Yeah, the first time through, it was it was okay. Right, I get, I'm getting some of this. And the second time, the time, and then the third time through, because of what you were saying, I actually bought myself a real to real machine just to the differences he's talking about between digital audio and analog audio. Yeah. And yeah, it's uh, quite a lot of work. What he's saying is like, wow, yeah, that's completely right. <laughs> so yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah, no, he's very good, very very experienced, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions, Logan? You talked about um, cutting off the top end on uh, horn systems. Is that something you'd recommend for kind of all PA work and obviously being outside and on top of a whole mix? Or yeah. Yeah. Yeah, completely. I think that um, in a lot of line array style PA systems, you get. Um, you don't actually get much information over about 14K if you're lucky. So what's happening is there's a lot of phase cancellation, phase shifting, um, and what we're trying to do is protect the part of the frequency range that we can hear. So adding those filters in will, um, be, just because we can't hear it doesn't mean it's not having an effect on what we can hear. So by adding these, adding these filters in um, to the point where if you pull it in and then you start hearing it, you pull it back to the point where you stop hearing it, and then it just clean. It does clean up the, what's happening in your top end, and actually it follows all the way down. You know, under, you understand the principle of uh, phase um, phase coloration, and it's kind of like a big string. If you if you pull something out here, it has a it has a, a it has an effect all the way down. So what you're doing is protecting the frequency range that, that we can all hear. And then, um, you, but you know, you are adding a, a phase shift, but you're only adding one rather than many by leaving your uh, frequency range all the way open. It's exactly the opposite of what you would do in a studio. Because our, you know, what we're fighting with in, uh, uh, in a live environment is, is, is acoustics and you know, multiple speakers rather than in a studio, you've just got a, a pair. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. This may be a really naive question because I'm a lighting guy. <laughs> Get out. From, from, from what you're saying, it, yeah. it, I mean, and thank you very much. It's been a very clear uh, demonstration of what you're talking about. Thanks. But from a lot of what you're saying, it seems like maybe the things that you should have under your fingers is not the volume control. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah. The vo vo volumes. The the the. The last thing that you do, like creating that, because actually, it's kind of, I was talking about this to some friends the other day, is that when, a lot of the time, when you're trying to make that mix have impact <coughs> on people, you turn it up. Now, 
there's a habit at the moment of losing <laughs> lots of low mid. And actually a lot of, a lot of the trousers element is, uh, is in that low mid. It gives all the vocals warmth. It gives you guitar drive. And by taking it out, you're losing that impact. And actually, by putting it back in, your whole mix will appear louder because that impact's back there, which is what you're trying to create by turning it up. So do you change what the faders on your desk do from, from just being the volume of the, the particular channel into the mix? Um, well, I mean, the, 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 the faders are just a, an easy go-to when you're trying to you're trying to get your mix together. And then when you're trying to blend your sounds together, it's all in the EQ. I mean, I spend most of my time on, on the EQ. You know, once you've kind of set your, set your rough mix up, then it's all, then it's all in the EQ, then it's all just the EQ. And the, and the other thing I've stopped doing is using graphic equalizers on, uh, on, the, on the main PA. Well, you like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pa parametric EQ all the way. Yeah. Because uh, on, a, on, on a graphic EQ, um, you get ripples. If you're pulling lots of things out, it's actually rippling, and you lots of phase shifting. Whereas it, by applying a parametric dip with a wideband EQ, you're actually affecting the phase a lot less than you are. And then you're adding those filters, it's a, it's a lot easier to do on a parametric. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Do you feel that there's the, 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 is the onset of the technology that's damaging the mixer? Because I'm, I'm seeing it, I work in a performing arts college. Yeah. But I've worked in the industry for, you know, a fair few years. And you just, you're seeing a lot of the kids coming through and all they're interested in is the technology. They're not listening to what's going on on stage. Buttons. Play yeah, with. play with the buttons. Yeah. And you think it's that, you know, when I grew up, I had just a desk and, as you say, parametric EQ and a few bits and pieces and that was about it. And you made your mix from that. Do you think it's the, the technology that's perhaps damaging that? Actually, this, this is a really interesting point, actually, because what we have with digital is far more control over our, over our signal. Um, and what comes out the other end of our digital mixing console is pretty much a near-on exact replica of what came into it. Um, so you haven't got... you. you the technology itself is brilliant, really good. You can be really precise. You know, um, like I was saying about painting a picture. Um, I had uh, the Midas Pro 6, which I actually believe is probably the best sounding console in the world now. Um, yeah, it, always, I was always an XL4 man. Loved it, still do, brilliant. But the, the Pro 6 is cleaner and you can really, really get in there, it's really precise. And I had a Function 1 PA system, and my, my God, I've been, it was so hard to mix on it, because everything was so, so, so precise. So you've really got to know what you're doing. But as far as the, the, the technology ruin, ruining mixes, I think you're right. I mean, I don't like the fact that I have to go through menus to find out where I'm going. I'm mean, having a look at the, uh, that Soundcraft VI-1, I'm scratching my head at it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, hang on a minute, this is, a, again, it's different. It's different from that, it's different. And then you walk over to the Allen Heath stand, you know, it looks the same, but, you know, and then there's people walking around mixing on laptops yeah. and mobile phones. <laughs> like, yeah. Hang on a minute, how can you put a mix together on that? I don't, you know, but I'm old school. I, 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 I've always been used to having my entire audio palette in front of me and tweaking and... Yeah. Stuff like that. I think John Newsham said something about um, uh, analogs. Uh, analogs for tweak, digitals for geek, <laughs> or something, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, good old John. Yeah. I'll just say I'm getting sick of this. You know, you see more engineers now looking at, you know, going like you say, going through the menus, spend more time doing that than actually going. Oh, hang on a minute, that base. Is obviously not right. I need to do something about it. It just seems to be spending it, all their time. It kind it, it kind of comes back to a situation where you, um, where as a mixer, you well, you do you split the front of house into two very distinct jobs. Do you have a system tech that looks after the sound of your mix, and then a mixer that actually mixes it. Um, so. I think that 
it's 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 so it's so difficult. I mean, the technology is great; it really is. But you know, I truly believe that learning to mix on an analog console gives you different pathways to actually putting a mix together, and how how you can teach the teach the newbies how to how to create a mix rather than go, oh, this plugin does this. <laughs> Plugin does that, and constantly on the screen. I mean, I I do it. I see myself doing it. You get a, you get a uh, did you design oh, sorry avid profile now, <laughs> and uh, there's a bloody great big screen in front of you. Well, I just turn it off. I don't want to see what I'm doing. I want to hear it. You know, I'm supposed to be looking at the band on stage, and you know, you you got to be in the room, not in the computer. Yeah. You know, it's, in in a way, we've become um, become more manipulators of data rather than rather than creative mixes. You know. Yes. Isn't it important, therefore, for a person mixing to be well aware of what's happening in the to, to the band and how it's <coughs> reacting with the audience? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole circle that goes on when the, when your band walk out on stage. Um, they need to have the confidence in you as an engineer to be able to put on their performance. Now, if they have the confidence, then they give the audience and, well, actually, they give me the performance that I need from them to make it sound good. Uh, and then the audience think, fuck me, that's brilliant. And they, like, get into it. And then the band go, this is a great gig. And they give you more. So it is a, it's, it's, a, it's a circle, you know. On one occasion, well, on more than one occasion, we had uh, a band turned up for the, the club. And uh, they'd been given the settings for the equipment by the, re by the, uh, the technicians uh, for a building that ne the, no, none of them had ever been in before. But that was the proper setting. Uh, it's an interesting theory, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I wish I was that good. <laughs> uh, I really do. If I can, you know, just, get, just give, it, give me a photo of the room and I'll tell you exactly how it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, you know, I mean, there, are, there are people who still believe that. Yeah. Uh, well, I know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit... Uh, it's just trying to change attitudes. And that's kind of what this is all about. It's not... It's, it's about looking at what we do in a different way. Because we have, as you said, you know, we've got so sucked into digital technology and plugins and, you know, oh, this can do this. You, we've kind of forgotten about actually what we're here to do. And it's mixed the show, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the last time you were talking about, you had a certain uh, set of outputs you brought, specifically the vocals that you brought with you to every show. Oh, yeah. Can you explain what that is? And <laughs> well, I'd, um, I did... Um, I did some work in a studio a while, like, a while back, and one thing I realised that a lot of mixing engineers in the studios are now putting, staying in the box when it comes to mixing, show, uh, mi mixing those, those records. And, but some guys have their choice pieces of kit, and they, they'll, take it, they'll take it out the box, and then they'll, you know, they'll run it through... Um, this equaliser because the top end is really nice and then it runs from that into another unit and then because that mid's really nice and really nice and warm and then it will run into another EQ because that low is really nice and warm. Kind of got me thinking that you know normally we'd have you know if you, you put a compressor on it and occasionally if you're really feeling fancy you might put a Put a put a uh, uh, an EQ and a compressor over a vocal that's not on the console. So it kind of got me thinking, like, actually, you know what? I love my. I bought an Avalon Seven Three Seven, and I love it. It's brilliant. But you know what? The EQ is not very good for certain things, and the compression is a bit. It's nice for certain things. It doesn't always work, but the sound when you put something through it, the sounds, oh, lovely. So I was like, hey, okay, well, with, uh, with LaRue, I was like, I, I love that sound, but I also, like, I have the stressor as well, and I think that's the best compressor in the world. It's so transparent. But I also love my BSS 901. <laughs> just a lovely, 
I know, let's put them all on there. And so you run into the 901, and then you create EQ on that, and then compress it on the distressor, the and then run into the Avalon with the compression turned in but taken out. So it just runs through that extra valve, uh, and you get a fantastic vocal sound out of it, really. And it works really nicely, really nice. With, uh, with um, C16, uh, I used to um, just have him on the Avalon, and when he would talk in the middle of, the, of, of, of each song, you just hear his voice through your feet. I was so, oh dear, lovely, really nice. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm rambling now. Yes? Radio mics are wired. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> actually, you know what? The new, the new Sennheiser range of wireless mics is very good. Yeah, AB the, a, B the um, we AB'd the, the 935 wired and then the uh, um, 500 the radio mic, and there really wasn't that much difference at all. Um, slightly more. I mean, only very slightly, really only very slightly on the, on the radio mic, it sounded a touch compressed. But really, it's, uh, it's very, very good these days. Um, uh, the, oh, oh, actually, I want to check out the new, um, uh, I know Audio Technica have been putting some, a lot of time and effort into their wireless stuff, so it'd be good to go back and revisit some of their stuff that I, from a couple of years ago. Mm. Yeah. If you take, on, take the top off, the, 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 I'm not taking my top off. <laughs> 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 Uh, that, the, uh, I, 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 get, I get where you're going with this. Now, um, there's, you can, you can apply this also to each individual channel. And what I said about it being a bit more creative, you can add dirt or you can clean it up. <coughs> so things like guitars that actually have a lot of harmonic distortion in it, you can if you keep it open on the channel, it will actually have an effect. You will actually hear that. It's just in the, it's just in the PA system itself. You're protecting the frequency range that we can hear. Um, I mean, there's, in, in line array systems, um, specifically, there's, there's a lot of phase cancellation and, and stuff going on in, those, in, in that top end. Because those high frequencies are so, sh uh, the, the wavelengths are so short, as soon as they come out, because they're so close to each other, they're just, they're, they're, they're cancelling. And then they're, they're, they're probably... Because the drivers are so close to each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's probably contributing a lot more to bad sound than actually adding filters. Right. Do, you, do, do you get what I mean? Yeah, I, 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 yeah I, I, understand what, I understand what you're saying, but I, I, mean, I, I, I would just be concerned about not something out of the mix that is, actually, that is absolutely, you know, that is, that is possibly contributing to it, albeit on a subliminal level. Okay, okay. Well, put it, put it, uh, take, think of it like this. How many of you have recently been to a gig and heard Sparkle in a PA system? Yeah? What PA system was it? Acoustics. Which one? They're actually using... Good question. Um, yeah, because in the audience, I guess. So they... Yeah, don't look up because I'm not sure. It's not a bad ship. Was it, was it, was it line array? Right? No. Yeah. Ah, see? Okay. Um, now what I... What was the answer to that? Was it, was it a line array system? No, no, no. He, uh, no, it wasn't. Um, but... For me, a really, really interesting thing that I've noticed a lot um, is that Sparkle just seems to have disappeared out of PA systems. When I first started mixing, my old governor told me it's all about the Sparkle. You know, make it shine. 
It's like polishing a mix. And these days, I hear my, my computer's got better definition in the high end than some of these BA <laughs> systems. And I don't, it's not down to the people mixing it. It's actually not, it's just down to a kind of, I think that we've got into this digital technology, we've got these MP3s, and we've got used to a certain sound. So it's not anybody's fault, it's just what's, it's what's, what's evolved. Now, if you go and hear a PA system that's got sparkle in it, you know, bloody hell, that's, you know, where's that come from? But what happens quite a lot is like, you hear it in the cymbals, hit the cymbals, they go rather than and that's, you know what I mean? And, that, and that's, what's, that's what's missing. So adding those filters, isn't getting rid of because it's not there anyway, <laughs> you know. But I I can't, I understand what you mean. Um, but that I think phase cancellation in that top top end is really uh, is more detrimental, I think, than than taking something out that's psychoacoustic. So, so you're on the lesser of two evils. Exactly. Yes. But also, another point is, is, um, is filter on the low end as well. Um, you know, because what you, if you filter in your, if you put a filter on your low end, I mean, we can't hear 13 hertz. Um, our subs, you know, will just fall apart the thought of trying to reproduce it. Our amps will blow up. So, you know, there's no point in just cranking up your, cranking up your bottom end. Also, and it's also bad for the environment. You use more power in your amplifiers. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, let's uh, let, let's cut that out. It also makes your, you makes your amplifiers more efficient, um, and that's that's a, that's a really good that's a really good point to sort of point out. I think. Um, yeah. Any other questions? I think uh, last one. Yeah. On the um, delay that you were talking about. Yeah. The ambient reverb. Presumably that is on, on the on the side chain rather than on the main signal going through. No, on the main on, on the main on the main signal. Right. Yeah, is it because what because what you what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a room within within that PA system. And so you just run everything run everything straight through that. There's no there's no side chaining involved. It's right. it's easily set up on straight through the reverb. Straight through the reverb, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, you don't. You what you what you it's a, it's a stereo yeah. sense. So you've still you, you've still got your clean channel, yeah. and you're just adding uh, you're just adding reverb to it like like you would normally do through an auxiliary. Um, and I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday actually about de slightly delaying one like so if, so your pan control when you pan something. Instead of it actually just getting quieter and louder, it just slightly delays one side, giving you the uh, perception of, which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of bordering on ambisonics, which I'm looking into at the moment, because it's very exciting. Um, uh, but it, it's, we're not quite there yet, and we've got to convince the manufacturers that we need to start linking the, their pan pot to auxiliaries and you know potentially delays and this that and the other um, so all good fun uh, well thank you very much for coming um, there's a, a copy of audio pro international uh, at the back with uh, a, there's a there's a flyer in there as well for my book which gives you 20% off uh, so go and buy it <laughs>